the title of this talk is What is the Object of Study? And this is a question whose meaning will be obvious immediately to many people. It's uh, an obvious difficulty in the field of the science of consciousness, the question of what kind of explanation is appropriate. And um, this resolves into the question of what object of study is involved. So what is consciousness? I'm going to take a kind of science historical approach, mainly. Um, well, and also looking at the, the history of philosophy to see where this um, supernatural approach, uh, something I'll explain, has come from. The supernatural approach that we call Cartesian dualism, uh, with some thoughts about Indian and uh, Chinese approaches to the subject. And finally, we'll look at a forgotten aspect of the Renaissance synthesis of uh, Arab thought and European ideas, specific, specifically looking at Leonardo da Vinci, to suggest a fresh approach to this very old problem. Now, at the recent international conference in Taormina, in Sicily, there was um, a so-called consciousness challenge. Uh, which meant that all of the participants were offered a, a list of um, current theories about consciousness and they had to choose which one they thought was the best. And uh, these are the results. And from this we see that while it's not entirely random, there's no overall result. It's not as if, you know, the, the ones that are the most popular all share some formal features. Um, there are some trends. One trend that we can see is that uh, theories of um, quantum scale events um, are moving forward as they are in biology generally. There's quantum biology, which uh, you know is well known now. Um, but you know there are many other hard science-based. Um, systems, theories, ideas, which are based often on incompatible theories. Um, another approach or another um, trend is that there's a, a growing presence of Indian ideas um, which are partly based on, on Western science and partly based on uh, traditional Indian approaches, um, specifically from Vedic Hindu thinking, um, but how are we ever going to decide which of these theories we like? How are we going to choose from among these theories? What kind of standards or principles could you ever apply to resolve this question? Now as to the, the, the question in the name of this conference about the revolution in neuroscience, I would say that there is a revolution underway, but for similar reasons. Um, it's one produced by the normal slow advance of experimental science rather than by any new consensus or dramatic advance in theory. There are all kinds of theories which are being developed, but as I say, you can't choose between them. And I think that there's a simple reason for this. Our conception of consciousness is of something immaterial. Now finding a definitive material explanation for immaterial phenomena is inherently impossible. But the wide range of, of approaches being accepted in the field among people who are looking at all the various different aspects of this uh, might be said to be to represent a revolution and it's a revolution of open-mindedness in that a lot of the ideas being considered um, are things that would have been dismissed out of hand by neuroscientists let's say of a previous generation um, now what we call dualism is based on a division of body and spirit 
you know, everybody knows what I mean, the words don't matter so much. And it's something that's almost universal in human cultures. But different kinds of explanations are given. Um, some people see themselves as being possessed or inhabited by spirits, or that they, they have animal spirits inside them, um, or, you know, different things. In Western philosophy, and therefore in science, our conceptions uh, really come from ancient Greece, and there was a division, the body was the soma, and for the spirit they had two terms, uh, one is psyche, which is where we get psychology, and the other is uh, pneuma, these are approximate pronunci pronunciations. Um, now what's interesting is that both of these terms mean breath, to breathe, to exhale, and um, this is a very natural belief, again held in many cultures, that the, the body is material and as long as it's breathing it's alive. So therefore the, the breath is a life force and when you stop breathing then you die. So that's where we started. In ancient China there's a similar belief, or terminology anyway, because there is this term qi. Um, meaning, well, it means thin clouds originally, but gas, air, breath, Chinese characters often have many meanings, but breath, and then by extension, again, vital spirit, the animating spirit. And that plays um, an important role in medical theory, martial arts, calligraphy, all sorts of aspects of Chinese culture, the qi, the vital breath, is very important. But there's another interesting term too, which is xin, and this means um, heart. You can see if you look at the character that it's, um, it's a picture of a heart, it's a very ancient pictogram, meaning heart. And the idea that the, the heart is the seat of the soul is another very widespread idea. For example, in ancient Egypt, they removed all the other organs, but they left the heart in the body when they were mummifying bodies so that they could be measured against the feather of the truth. Um, when the time came, and um, and yet this word had a very interesting development because when Buddhism came to China from um, India principally, but also a bit from Tibet, um, the elaborate Sanskrit and Tibetan terminology was translated using pre-existing Chinese characters, and the heart character was adopted for the Sanskrit term Samtana meaning continuity, but in this context meaning a continuous series of conscious moments, each of which is extinguished in the instant of creating the next one in the series. And this is a, a basic conception in Buddhism, um, in which the idea is that there is no constant soul or identity, there is only this constant sort of kinematic progression of moments. And what this illustrates is that Buddhism brought with it something new. Even though China had its, its own philosophical traditions, with Taoism in particular very developed, the um, Buddhist ideas brought a science of consciousness, a developed science of consciousness, as the Indians still call it today. Um, now, this Indian development has its own problems as far as compatibility with Western science is concerned which are mainly methodological. The data are not provided by experiment, but by introspection and especially meditation. Coupled with the study of ancient um, scriptures, uh, sutras and so on, no value is placed on falsification of hypotheses and instead direct knowledge of truth through enlightenment is the ideal. And so again, there's this sort of basic incompatibility. Um, you know, there's good work being done on, on bridging this gap, but the gap is, is still there. Now, if we look at our Western idea of knowledge through science, it's, as is, we've said, it's based on Greek traditions of natural philosophy. For 1,000 years, it was dominated by another idea, which was the scholastic idea of uniting faith and reason. 
which was a principle first stated by Boethius in the 5th century. The idea was to replace the pagan Greek philosophy with a Christian alternative, with a whole supernatural element placing theology and talk of angels and souls and so on above natural philosophy. The knowledge of theology was the highest form of knowledge, the awareness of God was the highest form of awareness, and so on in every field. Now this continued right up to Descartes, um, and by this time it accrued a well-developed um, system of logic and um, mathematics, although not so much of calculation. And but this was still deeply and permanently contaminated by these supernatural claims. Cartesian dualism suffers from exactly this combination. Descartes popularised the French word conscience, which we now translate into English as consciousness. Um, but this had already been used in, in Catholic theology for many centuries as the Latin conscientia, a scholastic term probably originating in, within that tradition with St Augustine. The term was discussed over and over again over many centuries and there were many different interpretations of what it is. For Augustine it was the self-aware part of your immortal soul and it would witness your judgment before God at the last judgment. For other authors it was something that came into being when you were baptised, when the, the new man, the inner man was created at baptism and th at this point this conscientia um, arose and um, it was also seen as the knowledge of oneself that one shared with God. So a recent study of the Latin sources concludes that for Descartes the only possible assumption is that conscientia means the knowledge that a thinker has of her thoughts in the presence of God. And we can also note uh, that the French term that Descartes used, conscience, now has two English versions, which are um, consciousness and conscience. Now the thing is that in French they're still the same thing, and in Latin, conscientia, it was the same thing. The, uh, the awareness of, of your consciousness was a moral awareness, and especially it was an awareness of your own sins and wrongdoings, which is why it's connected with, with this idea of the last judgment. And it's plainly a supernatural term. Um, in fact, the, the, the Catholic uh, practice of confession was linked in scholastic theory with the idea of making the, the, the person who's confessing aware of their consciousness, of their conscientia, which would enable them to think about their sins. So, now scholastic philosophy started with the suppression of pagan thought after the Christianization of the Roman Empire. But from about the 12th century, it faced a serious challenge um, in the form of the translations into Latin of Arabic philosophical texts, which were themselves mostly translations from Greek. So Aristotelian philosophy had made it into the Fatimid Caliphate. And this was now um, filtering into, into Western Europe. And it was a, a challenge to, to scholastic philosophy because um, in, in Christian Rome, it was Neoplatonism, already in Latin, which was the vehicle of classical philosophy. And um, they weren't really you know, up to date with this Aristotelian thought, which was the most developed you know, proto-scientific thought of, of the classical world. And um, they reacted, the, the, the Catholic um, religious hierarchy, by trying to absorb this and so specifically you had Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas as he is now, um, who tried to demonstrate that uh, in fact Aristotelian philosophy was exactly the same as established Catholic theology. A task he left unfinished but it seems a bit kind of misguided you know looking at it neutrally and in fact the Arabs were faced with the, the same problem because they had wanted to, to equate Aristotelianism with the, 
the ideas of the Quran, and they abandoned science. That was their system. There was the author Al Ghazali in the 11th century, I believe, who um, wrote a book called The Incoherence of the Philosophers. And after this, the um, the Islamic authorities decided that, well, you know, if 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 science says one thing and the Quran says something else, science is obviously wrong. However. There was one very interesting um, item of Arab thought which was transmitted in this same period, in the same channels. This was the beginning of the Renaissance, obviously, in Europe. And this was the um, Kitab al-Manazir, or the optics, of Ibn al-Haytham, who is called al-Hazen in the West, al-Hazen. And this seven-volume work um, is one of the most influential scientific works ever written. Um, and it was um, it was not a copy of Greek philosophy, although it was informed by, by Ptolemy and Euclid and so on. Um, but it was an original contribution with a sound scientific spirit based on observation and uh, even experiment. Unfortunately, its theory of vision um, was based on detailed but incorrect theories about what we would now call neurophysiology. So its main purpose failed in the long run and it's now largely forgotten outside specialist circles. However, it led to a revolution in the Renaissance that was very highly visible and influential, the practice of perspective drawing, which was based on a model of projective geometry derived from Alhazen's account of vision in terms of its Euclidean geometry. So vision, like other forms of consciousness, is, is immaterial, um, but approaching it by projective geometry brought, brought it under the control of mathematics and science, um, even with this incorrect approach to, to physiology, but without any need to appeal to religion, either Islamic or Christian, because geometry is fairly, you know, neutral from a religious perspective. So this led to a unique moment of scientific art because the practitioners of, of perspective drawing saw themselves as scientists. They thought that they were applying scientific principles to, to art, which indeed they were. But this was something that continued. Mathematicians were, became involved, they were interested in this. And the idea that we have a perspective drawing in its geometry today is largely derived from the work of the 18th century English mathematician, Brooke Taylor, who invented the Taylor series which is still used in, in calculus. And um, he invented the term vanishing point. And the vanishing point was a, t a technical term in Newtonian physics and mathematics from the Principia. Vanishing was a translation of Latin evanescere, which uh, was a, a term, you know, it's when if terms uh, tend towards zero, then they're vanishing. If they're tending um, away from zero, and they're nascent. Uh, anyway, this eventually led to the idea that we have today of the vanishing point as an infinitely distant point towards which you know things converge, railway lines or roads or whatever it is. This was not at all what it was in the Renaissance. Infinite space had not been conceived in the 15th century and would probably have been thought of as blasphemous by the church. And so, at first, perspective drawing was just a purely graphic method of representing architectural spaces, uh, as it's still used today, in fact. Um, but Florentine artists soon added uh, figures, religious figures, nearly always. Um, and we can see an example of this in the, um, the Annunciation by Fra Angelico from 1450, a, f a fresco in Florence. And you see it's only the architectural part that is really drawn in accurate perspective. And the vanishing point, or more accurately for this date, the Punto d'Occhio, is located in the little square window at the back. But as the technique spread, a new idea was found. And this is what I suggest we consider with fresh eyes. In Leonardo da Vinci's La Last Supper, one of the most famous paintings in the world, the plan of the painting is a symmetrical central point perspective, but the focal point, the centre of projection, is neither at an infinitely distant point nor at some random point to unlock the architectural representation. 
it is at the face of Christ, the principal point of attention. This system was not universal but was commonplace in Italian painting once the technique of perspective drawing was established and its possibilities were seen. So again, the reasons for this approach are found in the scientific treatise by al Hazen. And um, it's also reflected in Alberti, who is the leading Florentine theorist of perspective. The original idea being, being that straight in front of the eye, there was a ray of light, a straight uh, ray of light, that was perceived more clearly than anything else. Um, so this prince of rays located the apex of the pyramid of vision in Alberti's terminology. And it was explained in terms of the absence of refraction in a, in a perpendicular ray by Al Alhazen, who was basically following uh, Ptolemaic ideas of refraction. So the physiology was wrong, the, the, the idea of refraction was very approximate. But the thing is that this is now not just a diagram of vision, but it's a diagram of attention. The attention point is placed at the center of the projective construction and unlocks not the architectural background, although that's superimposed, um, but the structure of normal awareness. So this projective structure works because the attention point is also at the center of our normal consciousness of the outside world. But it is not only visual, and not just a question of focusing or directing the eye, which of course does not work like that. We can place the focus of our attention on anything. A thought, a sound, a smell, a physical sensation, a memory. And all our conscious experience is arranged according to that centralized geometry as we shift our attention around. Um, it varies constantly and dynamically while in a way remaining the same. When we are asleep or unconscious it is this geometry that disappears as the process of perspectivization temporarily closes down. So this Renaissance system is a much simplified diagram. The projection of data from our nervous system is not just a vision onto a two-dimensional surface, like a painting or a fresco, but of awareness into a constantly evolving three-dimensional image of the world. So that's the sort of screen containing living things and especially other people like us. The dynamic image of the living world is not a material object, but has geometrical regularities. Taking a geometrical approach allows us to explain this without recourse to the supernatural agenda of souls, spirits, or angels, and to take another step away from the medieval scholastic dogma that crippled the scientific project for centuries. But finally, to show that the scholastic synthesis was not all bad, here is Raphael's School of Athens, commissioned in 1508 for the Vatican. The figure of Plato on the left is said to be modelled on Raphael's teacher, Leonardo da Vinci, and this magnificent perspective study, designed to lead our attention naturally and harmoniously from group to group, individual to individual, inside a symmetrical architectural space, represented the optimistic vision of the Renaissance Church, in which the debate between Plato and Aristotle would allow the unification of philosophy, astrology and theology, a project which would befuddle the learned for some time to come. Thank you.